Hello, and welcome to GearFest 2021. My name is DJ Eclipse, and I'm so honored to bring to you one of the most iconic DJs in the world of DJdom, DJ Jazzy Jeff. We're talking about the effects of DJing during the quarantine and the pandemic and how we're going to move forward through that. We talked about gear selection, and we also talked about any advice that you would have for any upcoming DJs and producers. So please stick around, because following that, we have a live DJ set from DJ Jazzy Jeff. Gear Fest 2021. My name is DJ Eclipse. Let's get into it. All right. So we're at Gear Fest 2021, and it's an honor to be sitting down with one of the most iconic legends of the DJ game, DJ Jazzy Jeff in the building. How are you doing, sir? I'm great, man. How are you? Great, man. This is crazy. So how's it been going for you? Good. You know, it it was uh it was quite a pivot. Um, everybody kinda had to to figure out how you were gonna uh pretty much get through this whole pandemic, not just the DJs or the musician world, but just everybody in general. So Yeah. Um it was definitely one of them things that, you know, you 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 figure it out and you go with it. Right, exactly. So how have you adapted during during the quarantine as a DJ? And also, how do you feel about touring and going on the road? How you approach it? Once the club shut down and pretty much the whole entertainment industry shut down, you know, we started streaming, you know, and I originally started streaming just to kind of give myself peace of mind because I've been playing music for people for God knows how long. And you know, you realize that not only are you giving yourself peace of mind, but you're helping people cope through a global pandemic, something that we've never seen before. Right. So you were almost acting to a certain degree as an essential worker for people's mental. Um, and we kept doing it and kept doing it. And, you know, about two months in, we started getting phone calls from companies and corporations saying, hey, you know, we're trying to do some morale boosting for our employees. Can you do a stream? Um, and we literally turned it into a, a, a business, you know, to the point that um, I'm probably busier now than I was before the pandemic. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, like, the role of a DJ is not just playing records. Like, it is very psychological. Like, what you play affects people, and it affects moves. It affects, you know, like, to see people come in one way and leave another way. That is something I think a lot of people don't understand. I think that maybe this pandemic really helped other people understand that, that it, it's a lot more than just playing records. I know the other thing I wanted to get into was that DJs are now more than DJs. Like you have mm -hmm. to be a DJ, you have to be a marketing expert, you have to be a social media manager. Sometimes oh, you got to be a cameraman, a videographer, <laughs> a video a video producer. You have to be all of it. Do you think that now having to wear all those hats that it's that it affects DJ's ability to really be a DJ? Or like how do you how do you find that balance? of being able to wear all those hats and still be at peak at your craft. Right now, to me, this feels like when I first started. Before you had a manager, before you had an agent, you know, before you had a crew, you know, you plugged up your own turntables and you did your own tech work. And when there was a buzz and a hum, you traced that cable. You didn't have anybody, you know, when you did a when you did a party, you brought the speakers and set them up and played and then broke it down and put it in a car and drove home. You know, to me, that's all this is. So I think the people that are complaining about wearing all of these hats didn't necessarily come from the generation that you had to wear all these hats. You know, a lot of it, it's people who are used to someone being in those positions. But for the people who pivoted you know, you start to look like, oh, my God, like the way that I was doing it, it was so wasteful. I didn't think about my clothes for a year. I wasn't thinking about buying new sneaks for a year. You know, I was I was focusing on making music and playing music. And it wasn't any of the other noise that came around that people who had so many bells and whistles and it wasn't about the craft. Right. Didn't know what to do when this happened, because at the end of the day. Now you're stuck playing music. If you got lights, smoke, 
bombs, all the rest of that, that doesn't translate on the phone. Yeah. What translates on the phone is, is the, the music. music. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it, it really, to me, broke everything back down to what this was about from, from the beginning. This is about the music. How does the music affect people? How does the music make people happy? You know, and that's what this is. It's not the smoke or the dancers or any of that other kind of stuff. And that's cool, but it's kind of like that's not that's not the backbone of all of this. Right. The backbone is the music. Yeah, and and so do you feel like? Because I know for me it would it would almost wow me like when you would see opening DJs come in and they had no clue how to hook up their gear, or you know it's like well where do I plug this in at? And it's like for me I remember. Starting out as a DJ, you had to pay dues. You couldn't just walk in and get a gig. You had to literally work your way up, whether that was carrying records for another DJ, Mm -hmm. you know, doing other stuff, having to help hook up gear, lugging around stuff. And then after that point, you had to prove you had the skill set to be in there. And, And every week that you DJed, someone was standing on the side waiting for you to mess up. So they could take that spot. Right. And so it's like now, like, and even then it was still a spirit of friendly competition. It wasn't, it wasn't like hateful or, or, or nothing like that. It was just pure sport. It was like, you know, Hey, I have to show and prove every week. Do you feel like the newer generation not having to have that sense of friendly competition or really knowing their gear and things like that, do you think that it's affected them and that's why they can't wear or have a hard time balancing all the hats because they didn't have that that proving ground to get to that point? Well, I I, I have different answers for, for, for that. Um, I do understand that different time and different eras require different tools. Someone who may needed to learn how to uh, warm up something in a stove 40 years from now has an air fryer. Right. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like through time, you're going to have tools that are going to make certain things, you know, not needed. My wife and I were having a conversation and, you know, we were talking about in the next 20 years, um, what is going to be the reason for your kid learning how to write cursive? Right. You know, other than signing their name, you know, we used to have to do book reports in cursive. Now people type their book reports out on a computer and they hit print. Right. You know, so I understand the evolution of a lot of these things. I appreciate having to learn on turntables. I appreciate it buying records. But someone who's learning to DJ today you cannot fault or criticize them at all if they never touch the turntable. And you know like what's crazy? I, you, you're leading right to my next question because you were one of the early adopters of technology. Like yeah. of, of, of your, your generation of DJs, like I remember you being one of the first to really adapt like to Serato yeah. and stuff like that when a lot of people considered it like, cheating and they're like oh i'm not gonna bother with serato and man i'm gonna stick to my vinyl and it was like (laughs) i remember you being one of those people who adapted to technology early i've seen you even have debates online with people about you know about technology versus vinyl and stuff like that what what made you want to adapt to that technology do you feel like it's been an enhancement i am a nerd (laughs) i am a self-proclaimed nerd i am a tech junkie i am a geek I love electronics. I love technology. Um, I'm also a student of my craft that understands that the tools that you use will change. At the end of the day, there's not a piece of equipment that anybody will design that will show you how to read a room. Exactly. So I don't care what someone says, oh, you have the, the, the controller that you hit the sync button and it'll mix these two records together. If you don't know what two records to mix together, there's no program that can look out into a crowd and say, this is not working and you need to pivot and go down this lane and do it for you. So I don't care what the technology is. If you don't have the wherewithal 
and the music knowledge, it doesn't it it doesn't matter. And I had a female DJ in New Zealand tell me maybe 25 years ago, if you do a festival for 10,000 people, 700 people can see what you're doing. All the rest are hearing you. So they don't care if you are playing on a controller, turntables, or playing an iPod. They only care about what goes in their ears. That is the most important thing. I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on the wrong thing. Yes. You get people like, oh, man, he's using a controller. If I got 25,000 people out there dancing and having a good time, I win. A DJ is the servant of the people. I don't know if people realize that, but you are a servant of the people, and your job is to make people happy through music. How you do that does not matter. I've never had someone say I had a bad time because you were playing on the controller. And that's why I always tell people, like, the more important thing is knowing your records. Like, any DJ that's ever asked me for advice, I always tell them, know your records. Know your music. You got to know your music. You know, and if you don't know that, no matter what you're playing on, it's going it to be a bad night. I always admired that when you did that. Like, I remember because I, I used to have conversations with some people and they were just like die hard against it. And then watching people like you adopt to it early gave us hope to go, OK, we don't have to have these arguments if Jazzy Jeff is playing <laughs> with Serato. Oh, listen, it was you have no idea that first go around. When you start playing and you realize you got 500 hardcore DJs that are standing in the front because they seen you pull out a laptop and everybody has this face on like, oh, my God, what is he doing? And you almost have to break into a routine to make you understand that skills translate. Right. Like if you got skills, you got skills on a controller, you got skills on turntables, you got skills on an iPod. I don't care. Like though that that translates. Yeah. And as soon as people saw that Serato does the only thing, and, and this was my my argument to people, the only thing that Serato made easier was carrying your records. I was getting to that part because it's carrying your records. I don't have to carry 47 crates. I got them all in the computer. Yep. The needle can still jump. You can still mess up. If you if if you if you sucked before Serato, you <laughs> sucked suck after Serato. <laughs> right. So it does like it it didn't matter, you know, that people didn't really understand that. But once they got okay, you know, it's still this the same skills still apply. Then everybody was like okay, and that's when it turned into yeah, it's easy to carry your records now. And and even I think it even opened your repertoire more because now you have just endless supplies of records you can dig into like your set range now gets crazy that's a good and bad thing though yeah yeah that's a good be. and bad thing because if 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 i walked in my record room and had to play a set from all of the records in my wall it would be the most confusing thing in the world <laughs> right so that was the thing like just because you have the ability to carry a hundred thousand records don't mean you should mm-hmm you kind of need to still compartmentalize yourself. I've always treated my Serato crates exactly like I treated my record crates. Right. So what when you adopt new technology in, what are what are the key considerations that you're looking at to make sure you go, okay, I need to add this gear to my to my setup? I'm one of those DJs that I am always on the quest for the perfect set. Mm-hmm. Um just like a basketball player wants to play the perfect game, a golfer wants to play the ger perfect match, I want to play the perfect set. And what I understand is that set has everything to do with me and my mental, but it has everything to do with your equipment. That your equipment really should be great to you so that you can just focus on your technique. If you are worrying, like we were talking about, if you have to worry about your needles – then that's something that gets in the way. If you have to worry about your mixer, that's something that gets in the way. So I look for a gear that allows me to get out of my way. So a lot of the, the, the process of sitting down with some of the manufacturers, you know, there will be times that you would tell them that button 
is actually in the way yeah. or that's not needed. You know, I've been fortunate enough to help a lot of the manufacturers with the DJ gear that people are using. I designed the S9, I helped design the S11. I had input on the, the Rain 72 and the Rain 70. And all of those times, you're kind of looking at this gear that if there was something that I didn't like, I got on the phone with 30 other DJs and would ask the same questions. So it wasn't just my opinion. I'm surveying the whole landscape. Like, what do you think about this? Do you think, you know, what, what, if you had a chance to do such and such, what would you do? And you just jot down all of the notes because you kind of want something that's not just perfect for me, but in the ballpark range of majority of the DJs out there, these are all things that people would want and need. You know, we, Dicers were great. Dicers gave you four cue points. We really wanted eight. Right. You know, there, there's simple things like that that you can just add, you know, and then trust me, then you can go too far yeah. because then you can put the kitchen sink in something and then it confuses people, you know, so you have to draw that delicate line of being enough and being powerful, but not being too much and and getting confused in something. And I also know that you you produce, too, as well as DJ. How how did how did being a DJ help your role as a producer? Oh my God, that was that was everything. Um, I wanted to make what I played. I wanted to know how to make what I played, and I think uh, for for the DJ producers, there's a very simple and very honest way to approach this that sometimes we don't like. If you are the guy that's responsible for keeping the dance floor packed, is your song good enough to keep people on the dance floor? Good. Like you can't do, you know, people aren't going to stay on the dance floor because it's yours. It's got to be good. If, you know, I had an a, a, a OG in the music game tell me one day, if on Tuesday record day, Michael Jackson's record comes out and your record comes out, will people buy yours or will they buy Michael Jackson's? Right. And I'm not talking be, like who's bigger. I'm just saying, do you have a record that is comparable and sounds good and affects people like the Michael Jackson record? Right. You know, you can't surround yourself with people that think everything that you do is good. You need that one friend that tells you your beats suck. You need that one diabolical hater that doesn't like yeah. nothing. And if you get him to like it, there you go. <laughs> you got you got you one. All right. So just to wrap up, if there's any advice you could give to an upcoming DJ, an upcoming DJ producer, just from your decades of changing mm. the game and experience and how much you've contributed to the culture, which me, I'm appreciative of what you've contributed to the culture. I'm appreciative of everything that you've given and innovated and was an early adopter of. I feel like any advice from you is extremely valuable. So any advice that you have for the upcoming DJ or upcoming DJ slash producer, what, what would it be? One of the things that I tell people, especially today, is be 100% honest with yourself on why you're doing what you're doing. It is not wrong to make music to be rich. Just be honest. Mm. Don't say I'm doing it for the culture and you're doing it for the money. Right. If you're doing it for the money, just do it for the money because there's different routes. There's a route that you can do it to get the money. There's a route that you can do it if you love the art. If you love both of them, there's a middle ground that you have to play. I find so many people are too embarrassed to say why they're doing it. Right. I Listen, I equate everything to sports. There's a basketball player like Kobe Bryant that you never paid attention to how much money Kobe made because, you know, Kobe cared about the game. Yeah. And then you got basketball players that had – $300 million contracts because you know it's just about the money. Both of them are great players. One did it for this. One did it for this. Just be honest for why you're doing it. The quickest route for you getting to your goal is you being honest of what you want that goal to be. That was a dope answer. I couldn't ask for a better answer. Jazzy Jeff, thank you so much. Honored to have a conversation with you. Honored to do this interview. Thank you again for all that you've contributed to the culture. And we appreciate you. I appreciate you too. Thank you.